most high God. If that's not true, then we're going to show you you came here to worship. You came here to say thank you. You came here to unload all your burdens because he's a burden bearer. You came here to see which doors are open because he opens up all doors. If that's true for you, like it's true for me, then someone ought to stand up and just say thank you. Somebody ought to stand up and say thank you. Somebody ought to stand up and say thank you. And this is your call to worship. He's the lily of the valley, bright and morning star, sweet Jesus, sweet Jesus. He's the governor of our nation. Stand. One more time. Sweet Jesus, sweet Jesus. He's the lily of the valley, bright and morning star, sweet Jesus, sweet Jesus.
Lord. Praise the 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 Lord. Everybody. Praise the Lord. Father God, you woke us up this morning, Father God. We made it in here this morning, Father God, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father God, we are so grateful that you are still the God of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Father God, you still sit on the throne. There is nothing too hard for you, Father God. When we look at our lives, when we look at our families, our community, our world, Father God, we can become overwhelmed. But, Father God, you are in control. Nothing is too hard for you, Father God. There was no breaking news in heaven this morning to tell you what was going on in our lives, Father God, because you know all. So we just thank you. We just praise you. We ask you to forgive us, Father God, when we don't claim your promises, when we don't stand on your word, Father God, because your word is here to comfort us, to inform us, to encourage us, and even to convict us, Father God. So I'm just so thankful and grateful, Father God, that we are here in this place today, Father God. I'm glad to see my brothers and my sisters, Father God, but I came to see you, Father God. I came to be filled with your grace and your love and your mercy, Father God, to hear the songs of Zion, Father God, to hear the word of God, Father God. I do pray for my brothers and sisters who came this morning, who may be burdened down, Father God, who may be worn down by the cares and affairs of life, Father God. But Father God, we know that we can give our cares to you because you care for us, Father God. No matter, no matter what is going on, Father God, there is nothing too hard for you. So I'm thankful for our time this morning in Sunday school, Father God. I'm thankful that the ushers ushered me in this morning, Father God. I'm thankful for the song that was sang this morning, Father God, the call to worship. But Father God, we are so grateful for your word that will be coming forth from my pastor, Father God. We lift him up to you today. Father God, encourage his heart, Father God. We're grateful for his servant spirit, Father God. So help us, Father God, each day, Father God, to be faithful in lifting him up in prayer, Father God. We lift him up before you, Father God, as he imparts the word of God to us. We lift up Sister Veronica to you, Father God, his help me. Encourage her as well, Father God, as she stands beside him, Father God. And then, Father God, we just pray for a dying word, Father God. Those who are lost, Father God, those who may be in our own family, Father God, even some of us, Father God. So we just ask you, Father God, to heal those who need to be healed, Father God, those who have physical ailments, those who are struggling mentally and emotionally, Father God. And then, Father God, we especially lift up our African-American community, Father God, our young men, Father God, who seek to reach havoc in our communities, Father God. Help them to get a different mindset. Help them to know that you love them. But help us as the church, Father God, to get out of these four walls so that we can go and reach our dying world. So, Father God, we know you can work, Father God, but help us to be faithful, Father God, in lifting up ourselves and our community. And when you have worked, it's only you can because that is what you do. We won't steal your glory, Father God. We'll just say, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. In Jesus' name, we pray with much thanksgiving. Amen. 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 Can you please stand for the reading of God's word? We're going to be reading from Psalm 103, and we're going to be reading verses 1 through 13. And um, I'll read one verse. Then you all can read the next verse, okay? 
Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He will not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he rule our transgressions from us. And let's read together. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Amen. Amen. Please know that your hymn can be found in your book on page 54. Our hymn for this morning is Great is Thy Faithfulness, found on page 54 in the hymn book. Sing. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord.
one more time. Pray. Pray. that thing. Uh, on today, uh, and before we get into those, uh, I'm going to remind each and every one of you, uh, if you have not paid your tithes and offerings, uh, to do so. Uh, there are many ways in which you can. Uh, you can go online to our website, hillcrestweb.org, and click the Give tab. Uh, you can text to give. You can text support HBC. That's support HBC at the number 77977. Uh, you can uh, give through the app, just hit the give button, or you can mail us uh, your tithes and offerings by check to Hillcrest Baptist Church, 17300 Pulaski Road, Country Club Hills, Illinois, 60478. Uh, however uh, you give, uh, we are thankful, uh, thankful for your continued support of the ministry of Hillcrest Baptist Church. Uh, thankful for your continued support of us reaching our community with the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. With that taken in mind, uh, I do want to mention that we had our uh, business meeting on yesterday, our end of the year business meeting. I want to thank each and every one of you who attended uh, ministry council meeting and then business meeting following that. Uh, we went over a few things this year. It's been a rough year, uh, still overcoming the effects of covid uh, everyone is not back in gathered worship yet, uh, and so uh, we can thank the Lord that he is still faithful, that we have not missed a bill, that we have paid all our responsibilities, uh, and so I thank each and every one of you uh, for your continued financial support. But I also do want to mention uh, those of you who uh, have been attending or have been watching online uh, but haven't been paying your tithes and offerings, that the right time to do the right thing is right now. Amen? Amen. 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 God has been good to you every day uh, and every year. Uh, and we ought to show our gratitude uh, for what God has already done and who God is uh, by supporting uh, his church and obeying his word. Amen. 
Amen. So I thank each and every one of you uh, for your continued support. Uh, I do want to read a couple cards that we have here on today. Uh, before I do that, I want to say uh, congratulations. Uh, we had a wedding uh, this past Friday, so congratulations to Ginger Lawrence and Paris Simmons, Mr. and Mrs. Simmons now. Uh, we had a wonderful wedding celebration here on Friday, uh, and we are thankful to all the Lord is doing uh, in their lives. So have a great honeymoon. We'll see you back soon. Uh, this card says, thank you so much uh, to Pastor Adrian, First Lady Veronica, and our Hillcrest family. Uh, the world is a whole lot better place because of people like you uh, who bring so much happiness with nice things that they do. And with recent thoughtfulness still very much in mind, this is meant to bring a thank you to the very warmest kind. Uh, this is from the Billingsley and Glass family, uh, from Bill and family and the passing of his brother. Uh, thank you, Bill. We are glad to walk with you uh, in these times and grateful for you. Uh, amen. We also have a thank you card uh, from Sister Carolyn Austin Banks and family. Uh, and so uh, we thank you, Carolyn Austin. Love you much and grateful for uh, you. We also have a thank you card uh, from Al Jean Jefferson. Amen. Uh, thank you, Al Jean. It says, uh, Dear Pastor Robinson, my Hillcrest family, I'm grateful for your caring hearts and support as we celebrate the life of my sister Linda Faith Hooker. Uh, we appreciate every call, card, visit, prayer, and expression of love that you share. Thank you for being uh, our family. Amen. Amen. And then as a thank you card, uh, in loving memory of Lucille Harris, and that's from the, the Harris and Woods family uh, and the Ward family, thanking us for being uh, there with them. Amen. Amen. Now, part of the ministry of the church uh, is walking together with each other. Uh, through the stages of life. And so some of the cars were for weddings, some of the cars were for funerals, uh, but it's the job of the church to be there uh, with us uh, in every stage of life. And so we thank you, and I thank you as your pastor, uh, Hillcrest, for being such a blessing uh, to one another in times of trouble, calling one another, visiting one another, praying for one another, caring for one another, uh, is what the church should be doing. Uh, and it reflects the love and presence of God to each other uh, when we do so. And so I thank each and every one of you uh, for reflecting God's love. Amen? Amen. 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 Got some good news for us. Uh, told, told people at the business meeting on yesterday uh, that the new church we're helping to plant in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, Redeemer Baptist Church, and Pastor Cameron Dobbins uh, and his family, are planning a church in Greensboro, North Carolina, and we are helping support them uh, along with his sending church. Uh, we are coming alongside of them to help them be all God has called and created them to be. Uh, they had a vote on today. Um, Redeemer Church is born out of King's Cross Church. Uh, King's Cross is sending Pastor Dobbins with 50 members to go start a new church uh, in the black neighborhood in Greensboro, North Carolina. But they didn't have a building. Uh, and so the way the Lord hooked it up, uh, most church plants start uh, in a community center or meeting in a high school or in a hotel, and they're stacking up chairs and taking down chairs and putting up music equipment, taking everything down, packing it and going home uh, week after week after week after week. Uh, but the Lord set it up, uh, made a way for uh, Pastor Dobbins and Redeemer Church not to have to do that. Um, there was a church in Greensboro, a white church that was dying off, about 20 members, a nice building, uh, and they were in the black neighborhood, but they weren't really reaching their neighborhood, and so the church was dying off. Uh, and Cameron sat down and had a talk with them, uh, and they prayed together, uh, and what the church decided to do was have a vote, whether to give Redeemer Church and Pastor Dobbins the building and their bank account, and for all of them to join the new church. And so the white Christians decided to join the church of the black Christians uh, and turn over building and bank account. Uh, and so that vote went through just this morning. Cameron texted me just a moment ago before I got up and said, uh, the vote was successful. Uh, I am the new pastor of Redeemer Church, and we got the building. Uh, and so amen, amen. So I'm 
asking you to keep uh, Pastor Cameron Dobbins and Redeemer, Redeemer Church in your prayers. Uh, and we will have him come here in the 2023 year so you can see him. Uh, he can minister to us personally. Uh, but keep him in your prayer. They're starting a new, lo new location, starting a new church uh, in a new community. And we want them uh, to uh, reach that community with the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, and make much of our Savior. Amen? Amen. Amen. Got one more announcement. I know some of y'all are waiting on it. Uh, Broadview Baptist Church also voted in Pastor uh, Jasper Taylor on last Sunday. Uh, amen. Uh, and so so you, you lost a guest preacher when I'm out of town. Uh, Jasper is now out of rotation. Uh, but Broadview Baptist Church has gained a pastor. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen. Uh, and so keep Broadview in your prayers. Amen. One more announcement. What you got? Actually, one and a half past. I just want to just kind of let people know that the music department was still looking for faithful, dedicated, talented members. So please see me or Sharon Holmes if you're interested. Uh, we would love for you to join us so that we, you could be one a member of a powerful ministry that ministered to this wonderful body of Christ. Also, on the fourth Sunday, if you're not doing anything at 4 p.m., I invite you to be my special guest right. yeah. here at this church yeah. to experience a wonderful biblical story about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now, usually something like this usually is a ticketed kind of thing, but this is absolutely free. Right. And we're preparing for your listening pleasure. So please come and bring your family as it yeah. will be a wonderful start for a wonderful holiday. Season. God bless you. 4 p.m. for Sunday. I look for you. Don't let our guests come and not see Hillcrest. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. So join us November 27th uh, for Born to Die here at 4 p.m. Uh, also, uh, this week, uh, men's fraternity resumes tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. And so brothers meet me tomorrow in the Fellowship Hall at 6.30 as we will conclude our study um, that God can use imperfect people. Uh, and so join us tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. And then also Wednesday in the Word will be this Wednesday at noon and 7 p.m. Uh, in person and online. And so join us uh, for Wednesday in the Word. Amen. All right. At this time, we're going to ask Sister Keisha Ward to come forward uh, for an announcement about... Harvest Fest. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, church. Good morning. All right. Short, sweet announcement today about our Fall Fest. Um, we are now at our 14-day countdown. So Fall Fest is November 19th again from 11 to 5 p.m., we are still looking for volunteers. Um, so we have a lot of things going on in the Fall Festival event. So I'm super excited, super excited to see you guys' faces um, at this event. And of course, invite your families, invite your friends, invite your coworkers. It's gonna be a fun fellowship event. You can go to the next slide. Um, so this week in particular, just to keep you guys updated, um, from November 6th to the, I believe that says the 12th up there, it's a little fuzzy, but just to let you guys know, from November 6th to the 12th, we are taking donations. So again, if you guys want to drop off water, chips, pops, um, we do uh, still need those donations. So again, this week, up until uh, when the Fall Fest event occurs, we do need those donations. If you don't, if you're not able to come up here, please feel free to utilize one of these um, envelopes. Some people said they want to get money donations, so feel free to go ahead and put money in here. Just make sure you indicate Fall Fest on here so we know where those monies can be allocated. Next slide. Oh, I just said that. So the money donations, like I said, you can utilize this. So just make sure you um, indicate um, Fall Fest. You can go to the next slide. And then today in the sanctuary, right at the church, um, we're going to have a short, sweet, congregational meeting just addressing 
just some of the needs that we may have um, for the fall festival event. Of course, we still need volunteers. Um, we're pretty good with the coordinators, but of course, we still need volunteers. So please stay briefly after um, after morning uh, worship, and we'll have a quick brief meeting just to address some of those last minute needs for the fall festival event. I think that's it with the slides, right? Oh, committee. Oh, same thing. Committee, right? I believe that's what it says. Right after church. Yes, we're at our 14-day countdown. So again, you all to the committee members, please stay here right after church. And we're going to address um, the remainder of those needs for Fall Fest. Again, we're on our 14-day countdown. And I cannot wait to see you guys there. Thank you. Uh, Hillcrest Time, let's prepare our hearts uh, and our minds uh, for prayer. Uh, it is uh, prayer time, so we understand that, uh, that God answers prayer, uh, and that his answer to your prayer is not dependent on the position of your body. You can remain in your seat, you can stand where you are, you can come down to the altar, uh, but what's most important is the condition of your heart, uh, that you humble yourself and come before the true, true and living God uh, who rejects the proud but gives grace to the humble uh, and let us prepare our hearts and our minds as we come before him. Our Father and our amazing God, uh, creator and sustainer of all things. Uh, Father, we thank you for the amazing grace that is another Sunday morning worship experience. Uh, thank you, Father God, that you uh, woke us up this morning on purpose and for a purpose. Uh, not because we deserved it, not because we have been perfectly obedient in every way, uh, not because we did everything that you have required for us to do, but because of your great love for us, uh, you opened our eyes filled our lungs with your breath once again and you gave us another opportunity to lift up your name uh, to walk with you uh, to hear your word to obey your word uh, to worship you in spirit and in truth uh, to gather together with our brothers and sisters and, uh, to encourage one another pray for one another uh, walk with one another uh, and experience the amazing grace that is your love toward us for all that, Father God, we say thank you. Uh, thank you, Father God, uh, for your church. Uh, and Lord, that you have established an outpost of your love uh, and placed them in every neighborhood throughout the world. That no matter where we are, uh, we can gather together with our brothers and sisters and hear from you. We can call upon your name. We can lift up our voices in prayer. We can lift up our voices in worship. Uh, and we can hear from your word. And we thank you, Lord, that your spirit leads, guides, and strengthens us throughout that process. Uh, Father, we thank you for uh, everyone here and everyone online today. Uh, praying, oh Lord, that you will hear and answer each of their prayers. Praying, Father God, that you would uh, minister to them right where they are. We thank you, Father, for everyone who's serving on today. We thank you, Father God, for the worship team and the media team, for the ushers, uh, for uh, all who have submitted themselves, oh Lord, uh, to serve one another so that we all can worship on today. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the amazing grace of what you are doing for Pastor Dobbins at Redeemer Church. Uh, that you are sending out laborers into the harvest. For truly, Lord, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Uh, so, Father, we pray that you would give him favor in that new neighborhood, uh, that you would open uh, the eyes of the blind, uh, that you would heal the hurting, uh, and do it all by your love and by your word. Uh, we pray, O oh Lord, that you will supply their every need according to your riches and glory. Uh, and then, Father, we thank you that you have promised to do the same uh, with all your children. Uh, Father, we lift up uh, the Hillcrest family before you. Uh, for the prayer list continues to grow, but no matter how long the list, uh, the list does not outgrow your power to heal, your power to strengthen, 
and your power to comfort uh, and your power to save. We lift up the Banks family before you, Father God, and the Billingsley family, the Kane family and the Cameron family, the Carroll family and the Copeland family, uh, the Davis family and the Franklin family, the Gilbert family and the Grandison family, the Grant family and the Graves family, uh, the Johnson family and the Lampley family, the Malloy family and the Malone family, the Newtall family and the Pierce family, the Ray and the Rayburn families, O oh Lord, the Richardson family and the Rogers family, uh, the Starks family and the Worth family, the Woods family and the Worthy family, the Young family and each and every person under the sound of my voice. We need you, Lord, because there is nobody greater. We need you, Lord, because we can't fix everything ourselves. We need you, Lord, because you and you alone are sovereign in all that you do. Father, you know where we are. You know our hearts. You know our issues. You know our sins. You know our strengths. And you know that we need you. So, Father, we submit ourselves unto you today. Speak, Lord, that your children may listen and obey. Heal, Lord, that we may give you glory. Comfort, Father God, that we may lean and rest in you. Have your way today. In Jesus' master's name we pray. And all God's people said amen. Can you say that? Nobody prayed. Nobody greater, nobody greater than you. Do I have a witness out there? Nobody greater, nobody greater, nobody greater than you. I don't care what the doctor told you. Nobody greater. Nobody greater, nobody greater than you. I don't care what the bill collector says. Nobody greater, nobody greater, nobody greater than you. Nobody. Nobody greater, nobody greater than you. Not only do we serve a God who's great, but we serve a God who's also magnificent right. and holy. Yeah. 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 Hallelujah.
forgive us and cleanse us all in righteousness. We thank you, Lord, that you are holy and that you've called us to be holy as you are and that you've filled us with your spirit that we may do that which you've called us to do. So help us, O oh Lord, not to lean to our own understanding, not to depend on our own strength, but to yield to your spirit that we may walk in righteousness before you. Now, Lord, uh, we need to hear from you. Speak, Lord. Uh, speak by your word, through your servant, uh, to your people and for your glory. It's in Christ's magnificent name that we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 If you can, stand with me and turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, beginning at verse 31 and ending at verse 32, I want to read a couple verses of scripture for you and share with you what the Lord has been sharing with me over the past couple days. Luke chapter 22, verse 31 and 32. Luke 22, verse 31 and 32. All right, when you have it, say amen. amen. If you don't have it, say wait a second. Read from the English Standard Version. It says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demands to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Word of God for the people of God. We're going to talk, tag this text today, sifted, uh, but strengthened. Yeah. Sifted, but strengthened. I'm a basketball fan. I used to be a basketball player. But now that my knees have given up on me, I'm just a basketball fan. Uh, and one of the things I like about basketball uh, is that you don't always have to get it right to be a winner. Uh, in basketball, uh, they've got stats to prove this. Uh, the team that rebounds best usually wins the game. Uh, that means that they understand during the game they're not going to hit every shot. Uh, but if they rebound well, if they grab their misses uh, and then put them back in the goal, uh, that team usually wins the game. Uh -huh. Now, in basketball, you, you miss a shot for a lot of reasons, Phil. Sometimes you miss the shot because you were aimed in the wrong direction. Uh, sometimes you miss the shot because there is an enemy in front of you trying to stop you from hitting the shot. Uh, sometimes you miss a shot because your depth perception is off. Uh, you thought the basket was 15 feet away when it was only 14 feet away. Uh, but there are many reasons to miss the shot. Uh, but a good coach will teach his players how to rebound. Because he knows you're not going to make every shot. Uh, and a rebound is just to catch the ball when it misses the mark uh, and then put it back in the goal. Well, this morning, I'd like to introduce you to my friend, Peter. <laughs> Peter's a good rebounder. Yeah. Because he didn't always hit the mark, but he always got back up and made it to God's goal for him. Yeah. Uh, Peter loves the Lord. He's a committed follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, but just like you and I, Peter's not perfect. Uh, sometimes he's a leader who knows just what to say, and other times, it seems like Peter can't keep his foot out of his mouth. Yeah. Sometimes he surprises you with his faith. And other times, he shocks you with his failures. And the life of Peter reminds us that you don't have to be perfect to follow Jesus. But you do have to learn how to trust God after you fail. In this life, every disciple will find times when we let God down. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
But if we trust God, God can even use our failures to strengthen our faith in him. Let me show it to you in the text. The text begins with an address to Simon. Jesus turns to Peter and says, Simon, Simon, behold. Uh, when he says, Simon, Simon, behold, he is arresting his attention, but he's also showing us it's an expression of intimacy. Whenever in, in the Hebrew culture, whenever you said someone's name twice, it was because they were close to you. You were expressing your love for them. And so the text starts with a double address. He says, Simon, Simon, behold. And you Bible students know that it's an interesting study to follow the times Jesus calls someone's name twice. In Luke chapter 10, 41, he says, Martha, Martha, and you worry about many things, but there is one thing needful. In Luke chapter 13, he looks over his beloved city and says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets. So often how I wanted to gather my children together, but they were just so rebellious. Uh, and then here he says, Simon, Simon, behold. He calls him Simon twice because he loves him. But he also calls him Simon because he nicknamed him Peter previously. But he's acting like his old nature right now. He's acting like who he was before God called him. And so he says, Simon, Simon, behold. And every once in a while, in this walk with Christ, we revert back to our old nature. Every once in a while in this walk with Christ, no matter how good we think we're doing, no matter how close we think we're following, something happens and words just come flying out of our mouth. Stuff that you thought you were past. Yeah. Things you didn't think you'd ever say again. And it just happened to pop up. Simon, Simon, behold. Jesus arrests his attention, but he also lets him know how much he deeply loves us. But he arrests his attention because he knows that we don't easily hear what God has to say. Sunday school lesson just this morning talks about the fact that we hear four to 10,000 different messages a day. Between that phone, that TV, and that radio, someone is always trying to get your attention. Uh, and we don't always hear God easily. And sometimes God has to arrest our attention to tell us something important. So he says, Simon, Simon, behold. Brothers and sisters, there are many people trying to get your attention in this life. Yes. Uh, many people trying to get you to embrace their version of truth. Yes. But when the God who is truth speaks, you need to drop everything yes. and listen to what he has to say. Yes. Because the truth is, your mind is a battlefield. Yes. Uh, and so you have to discipline what you let into your mind. Uh, because yes. Satan wants to control your mind. But God wants to sanctify your mind and conform us into his image. So it begins with the address of the Savior, Simon, Simon, behold. But then we hear a request from Satan. Look back at your Bible. It says, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. Oh, Jesus says, Simon, pay attention. I got some bad news for you. Satan has them asked for you. He has demanded to have you that he might sift you as we. Now that's bad news. Jesus has let Peter in on a conversation going on in heaven and he knows nothing about that Satan has requested to sift Peter. Matter of fact, it lets us know a few things that you may not have known. It says Satan has asked for you that he might sift you as we, you didn't know Satan had a prayer life, did you? But he's talking to God and he makes a request. That means he is praying that he can sift Peter. This text lifts the curtain on some things that are beyond our understanding, some things that are beyond our authority that Satan requests to sift us. It's not the first time it happened. Flip open to the first chapter of Job, lets us know that Job was a man in the land of Uz. 
and he was just going about his business. And the Bible tells us that Satan was going to and fro, seeking whom he devoured. And he shows up in the court of heaven. And God said, have you considered my servant, Job? We spent a lot of time listening to a lot of conversation. Conversations with people on Twitter, conversations with people on Instagram, conversations on TikTok. But there are conversations going on that we don't even hear that are much more important than the stuff we fill our day with. Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you as wheat. Ain't it funny? (laughs) Satan don't want you to pray. But then he wants to come to God with a prayer request. (laughs) Satan knows the power of prayer. That's why he doesn't want you to pray. Satan knows that prayer works. That's why he's always trying to keep you from praying. So when you don't feel like praying, pray. When you don't think you should be praying, pray. When you're not sure what to pray about, pray. And the Holy Spirit will interpret your prayers because we need to pray. There's power in prayer. So much power that Satan doesn't want you to do it because he doesn't want you to overcome his plan and purpose for you. Satan makes a request. But the text also lets us know that Satan has to get God's permission. If Satan was all powerful, he wouldn't have to ask to sift you. If Satan was all-powerful, he wouldn't have to ask to torment you. If Satan was all-powerful, he would just kill you anyway. But because he's not all-powerful, he has to make a request. Sometimes we're concerned about the wrong conversation. But Satan has to request God's permission. Hear me, church. Nothing happens to us in this life without God's permission. He is the sovereign Lord. And everything that happens to us is either God ordained or God allowed. Uh, Sometimes God allows us to do what we want to do. Even in disobedience to his will. To allow you to see the consequences of your own choices. And allow your sin to turn you back to the God who knew what was best for you in the first place. So Satan makes a request, and nothing happens without God's permission. Job chapter 1, he says, have you considered my servant Job? And then Satan answers back and says, well, he only follows you because you give him everything. He's like, you got a hedge of protection around you. Did you know you had a hedge of protection around you? That the God who created you, the God who loves you, protects you from dangers seen and unseen. But in Job 1 and 12, the Lord says to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your hands. But on the man yourself, don't lay a finger. Satan has to get permission even to attack us. Satan, the enemy of your soul, would destroy your life if he could, but he can't because he don't have that power. He can't because God will not allow. Matter of fact, John 10 and 10 says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And then Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and life abundantly so. Satan wants to kill, steal, and destroy, but he can't do it to a child of God. Because we belong to him and he came that we may have life and life abundantly so. So we see Satan's prayer that he has asked to sift us as we. But then the purpose is not just to sift Peter. Look at verse 31. It says that he, Satan demanded to have you. That's the you plural in the Greek. If Jesus was a Texan, he would have said, Satan demands to have y'all. He's not just talking to Peter. He's talking to all the disciples that Satan has demanded to sift them like we. 
Satan's purpose to test them. Sifting process was a biblical process that we don't really use nowadays, but what it was was a process familiar to the Palestinian farmers. What they would do was they would harvest the wheat, they would bring it back to a, to a farmhouse or to a building, and they would throw the harvested wheat up in the air and allow the wind to blow the husk off the wheat. They would keep throwing it up in the air and catching it in the basket, throwing it up in the air and catching it in the basket, throwing it up in the air and catching it in the basket because the wheat was heavier than the chaff. The grain, the seed itself was heavier than the husk around it. And they would keep throwing it up in the air and catching it and throwing it up and catching it and throwing it up and catching it to separate the chaff from the wheat, yeah. to separate what was useless from what was good to be consumed to separate what was garbage from what was seed. And so he says, Satan desires to sift you like wheat. Yes. Chaff was useless. You couldn't eat it. But the wheat was what provided their food. It was a process of preparation to divide the wheat from the chaff. Yes. Here it is. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan desires to sift you like wheat. He says, Satan wants to violently shake up your life <laughs> with the hope that you will fall away from your faith in God. He says, Satan wants to turn your life upside down to get you to fall away and stop following me. Satan hopes to reveal something worthless in you and then try to convince you to turn your back on the God that believes you're worth everything. And surprisingly, the very process that Satan chooses, God uses. The very process that Satan requests, God says, okay, if that's what you want to do, all right, I'll let you toss them up and down. I'll let you throw circumstances at them. I'll let you turn their life upside down. In the midst of that sifting, I will strengthen their faith. Yeah. God allows sifting in our lives to separate what's useless and unprofitable from us. Because if we're honest with ourselves, there's a little chaff in our lives. There's some things that we do and some practices that we do and some habits we have that don't glorify God. They don't obey God. They don't lift up his name. They're in rebellion to him. Plain and simple, they're sin. And God allows Satan to sift us so that the sin can fall away. There's some pride in us. There's some unforgiveness in us. There's some envy in us. There's some greed in us. There's some anger in us, and Satan comes to sift us, and God allows all that stuff to fall away so that what he has placed in us will remain. You've heard the phrase, a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. But then when sifting time comes, we want to hide. When sifting time comes, we want God to end it as fast as possible. But the question is, is your faith of substance or is it just chaff? Yeah. Is it useless for nothing? Yeah. Or has it helped you to sustain the trials and tribulations of this life? Yes. Jesus warns Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you as we. And boy, I wish sometimes that God would have gave me a warning before them sifting showed up. Because every once in a while, I'd just be minding my business. And the phone would ring. And sifting would be there. Or I'd walk into the office building thinking everything was good, loving the Lord, and minding my business. And bam, it was sifting season all of a sudden. But God has a way to let us know that it's coming. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demands to have you, that he might sift you as we. We see the address to Simon, we see the request of Satan, but then finally in the text, we see the intercession of the Savior. The text starts off with some bad news, Phil. It says, Simon, Simon, behold, 
Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you as we. But then it goes from bad news to good news because Jesus says, but I myself have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. The bad news is that Satan wants to sift you. But the good news is that Jesus has already prayed for you. And that's good news. And some of y'all have been facing sifting over this past year. COVID has sifted you. Family trials have sifted you. Job issues have sifted you. Mental issues have sifted you. Health issues have sifted you. But I got some good news. Jesus has already prayed for you. The bad news is Satan wants to pray on you. But the good news is that Jesus is praying for you. Robert Murray McShane says, if I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet, the difference, the distance makes no difference. Jesus is praying for me. So Jesus gives us the bad news. Satan wants to sift you. Then he gives us the good news. He says, but I have prayed for you. You Bible students know that whenever you come across scripture and when you're reading the word of God and you come across a but, you know there's about to be a contradiction going on. There's about to be a change of direction. Matter of fact, but is the conjunction of contradiction. It says that the statement that was said before is about to be changed by what's about to be said after. So Jesus lets us know what he's about to say overrules all of Satan's plans. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan desires to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. Yes, Satan wants to sift you. Yes, he has a plan to harm your life. But you will survive and be strengthened by your sifting because Jesus himself has prayed for you. And whenever you're reading scripture and you come across that divine conjunction, you can stop and praise God right there because you know good news is on the way. Psalm 30 and 5 says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Romans 6 and 33 says, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. Yeah. Romans 12 and 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yeah. 2 Timothy 1 and 7 says, For God gave us a spirit of fear, not a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and self-control. Yeah. Don't stop reading your Bible at the bad news. Keep reading, because good news is on the way. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. I love the second part of the text because Jesus says, I have prayed for you. Matter of fact, it's an emphatic I in the Greek. It's ego, I me. Jesus says, I myself have prayed for you. Jesus didn't ask someone to pray for you. He didn't tell someone to pray for you and they forgot about it. No, he says, I myself have prayed for you. And somebody here today needs to know that Jesus is praying for you. Matter of fact, Jesus has already prayed for you. He knows what's around the corner. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He knows that you're going to need him, and he has already prayed for you. And I thought you'd be a little more excited about that, but let me help you see it. The co-creator of the universe has prayed for you. The second person of the Trinity has prayed for you. The high king of heaven has prayed for you. The one who conquered death, hell, and the grave on a three-day weekend has prayed for you. And because he saw it, because he's all-powerful, yeah. when he prays, things happen. Yeah. When Jesus prays, yeah. lives are changed. Yeah. When Jesus prays, yeah. people are healed. Yeah. 
When Jesus prays, addicts get clean. When Jesus prays, marriages turn around. When Jesus prays, demons flee. Jesus has prayed for us. Peter had no idea what was going to happen. Peter had no idea what was ahead in his life. Jesus had, Peter had no idea that dark days were ahead, but Jesus had prayed for them. That reminds us that there is no breaking news in heaven. Every once in a while, you know, your phone will give you one of them alerts. Breaking news. Such and such, such and such. Just the other day, I was downstage at the state convention. I take care of convention business for the church. Veronica's at home by herself, so I'm a little concerned. And I get a breaking news from my city, from the police department. Breaking news. We're pursuing a suspect on such and such street. And so I immediately turn around and text Veronica. Breaking news. And where are you? (laughs) Because I want to make sure she's not where the suspect is. But there is no breaking news in heaven. There is nothing that goes on that your sovereign Savior does not know about long before it ever happens for us. Peter didn't know what was coming, but Jesus did. And so he prayed for us. Jesus knows what your future holds because he's the one who holds your future. And so why wouldn't you spend time praying to him? Why wouldn't you, before you stepped out of the house, bow yourself and have a conversation with Jesus? Song says, have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your troubles. He'll hear your faintest cry and answer by and by. But now does he say, I have prayed for you. I myself, but he says, I have prayed for you. And it's in the past tense. He says, I have already prayed for you. Jesus had already prayed for Peter before this trial ever happened. And that got me to thinking, well, when did he pray for Peter? Was it in the Garden of Gethsemane? No, because that don't happen for a few more verses. Uh, was it the Lord's Supper? No, that wasn't it. He may have, but that's not the first time. Jesus had prayed for Peter before he ever called him to follow him. And you need to know that while you were in your mama's womb, Jesus was praying for you. That before he ever called you out of your sin into himself, he was praying for you. So while you was out there like me, partying hard and doing all you could, Jesus was praying for you. And because he prayed, you came to him. Because he prayed, you turned from your sin. And because he prayed, you accepted him as Lord and Savior. Jesus prayed for us. John 17 and 15, in his high priestly prayer, he says, I don't ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Jesus is praying that God protect us from the enemy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so if Jesus is praying that we are protected from the enemy, then why are we playing with the enemy in the first place? Why are we playing with the one God is praying that we are protected from? You can't play with Satan. Satan desires to sift you like we. Listen here, Peter wasn't praying for himself, but Jesus was praying for him. And I'm convinced that because of arrogance or ignorance, we don't pray when we need it most. Peter should have been praying at that very moment. But when he wasn't, Jesus was. And when Peter didn't know he needed to pray, Jesus had already prayed for him. Hebrews 7 and 25 says, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for us. Jesus is always praying for you. Once you accept him as Lord and Savior, he is your intercessor. He is your great high priest, and he is always praying for us. Somebody prayed for me, had me on their mind, took the time and prayed for me. But what does Jesus pray? Look, he prays that your faith Fail not. You read the Bible too fast, you miss it. He says he's praying that they don't give up on God. He used the Hebrew, a Greek word here, 
Uh, it's the same word we get our English word for eclipse. He is praying that your faith does not eclipse. In biblical days, the worst thing that can happen was an eclipse. Yeah. It ain't no big deal to us nowadays. It's 2022. We all got electricity. We all got battery backups. We got flashlights, lights on our phone and everything. But in biblical days, there was no electricity. And when an eclipse happened, it was completely dark all over the world. It was the worst thing that could happen in biblical days because they came without warning and darkness covered the sun and they often thought it would be the end of the world. The average total eclipse lasts for about seven minutes. But in the midst of those seven minutes, they thought the world was coming to an end. And so whenever the eclipse came, people would panic because they thought this would be the end of the world. Well, Jesus says, I'm praying that your faith would fail not. I'm praying that your faith would not eclipse. I'm praying that in the midst of this storm, you don't think it's the end of the world and give up because the sun will shine again soon. So Jesus prays that our faith won't eclipse. He's praying that the movement of your circumstances doesn't block your view of the sun and that you focus so much on the problem that you don't see the God who can solve the problem. But notice, Jesus doesn't pray that we'll escape the sifting, or he doesn't even pray that Satan will fail, but he prays that our faith won't fail. Amen. He prays that you won't give up on God in the midst of your tribulation. Amen. Matter of fact, Jesus doesn't even pray that we don't fall. He prays that when we fall, we don't stay down and stay in our sin. He says, I prayed for you that your faith will not fail fail. You see, Peter's not kept from stumbling, but he is kept from falling. Yeah. God allowed him to stumble to show him how weak he was yeah. and how he needed to keep walking with God. Yeah. And no matter how strong Peter thought he was, he still needed God. Amen. It's not a coincidence that Luke 22, 31 and 32 happens right after the passage in 24 through 29. Well, they were arguing, the disciples were, about who is the greatest. Yeah. And so obviously, Peter must have been saying, I'm the greatest, and all y'all need to be following me. I'm second to Jesus. And then Jesus turns around and says, Simon, Simon, behold, yeah. Satan has demanded to sift you all like we. Because sometimes we get big-headed. Yeah. Sometimes we think we Jesus' right-hand man. Yeah. It can't doesn't happen without us. And Jesus warns us because of our own arrogance, Simon, Simon, behold. Jesus prayed that their faith would not fail. He prayed that they would be kept by their faith in God. But his prayer has a purpose. Look down at your Bible one more time. He says, and once you have turned again, Strengthen your brothers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus prays for us. Mm -hmm. Jesus prays for Peter. He prays for his disciples, but his prayer also has a purpose. He says, once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Yeah. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan desires to sift you like wheat. Mm -hmm. And he lets them know. He says, Peter, you're going to fall. He says, but once you get up, go back and strengthen your brothers. Amen. Amen. Sometimes we think we're super Christian. Amen. Like we, nothing's ever going to happen to us. <laughs> but the Bible is filled with faithful followers of Jesus Christ yeah. that had to go through trials and tribulations. Yeah. Faithful followers of Jesus Christ that had to endure the death of loved ones, the murder of loved ones, had to endure poverty and trials and tribulation and pain, all because we live in a lost and broken world. And so he says, and when you return, strengthen your brothers. He literally says, when you turn around, after failing your Lord, 
The believer is to repent and turn back to God. Yeah. Look here. Yeah. God knows you're not perfect. <laughs> he knew that in the first place. Yeah. That's why he sent his son to save us from our sins. Yeah. Because he knows we're sinners who need a savior. Yeah. And now that we're saved, you're still not perfect. As you practice his word, as you walk in your sanctification, as you grow in your relationship with God, we sin less, but we're not sinless. And when we fall, it's our job to get up and go back to God, to retrace our steps and turn back to the God who loves us. I told you I was at convention this week and I was running around trying to get everything done, taking calls and running back into meetings and running back and forth from the hotel there once in a while. And I got to one point, checked in my pockets, checked in my little book bag pocket. Like, I know I have my ear pods this morning. Where are my ear pods? Well, okay, slow down. Check your pockets again. Check your book bag again. All right, I don't have them with me. When did I have them last? So I had to retrace my steps. So I went here and I went there. And you know what? The last time I know I had them was in the hotel room on the phone. And so I had to drive back to the hotel, retrace my steps, and return to where I walked away from my ear pods. It's the same thing in our walk with God. When we find ourselves in sin and away from him, the way back is to retrace your steps. How did I get here? How did I get so far away from God? Let me walk back to him. And so he says, when you retrace your steps, strengthen your brothers. For someone, that means repentance. For someone, that means returning to your calling. For someone, that means returning to worship. But the way to get back to God is to retrace your steps. Peter thought he was ready to leave. He thought he was ready to take over as leader of the disciples. But his mouth was writing checks that his faith could not catch. And so Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan desires to sift you as wheat. Because God knows that where there is no sifting, there is no serving. God has no unsifted servants. We have to learn to humble ourselves, to trust in him, and to have faith in him and not our own abilities. So he says, and when you turn back, strengthen your brothers and sisters. God is so sovereign that he doesn't even waste our sifting. Satan desires to sift you like wheat. God says, let me use that. Let me use that to strengthen you. As a matter of fact, when you turn, strengthen your brothers. He uses our sifting to strengthen our faith and to encourage others. Hear me clearly, church. Once you've repented and turned back to God, you ought to take what you learned from your sifting and teach someone else so that they don't have to fall in the same hole you fell in. Brothers and sisters, ultimately, Peter's faith isn't displayed in his sinlessness. His faith is displayed in his repentance. His faith is shown after he fails God that he doesn't stay down. He gets up and returns back to God. Falling isn't a sign of faithlessness. Staying down is. Yeah. It was windy as all get out yesterday. And most like most of you, when I got home, my backyard furniture was all over the place. <laughs> but because the wind was still blowing, I left it right there. <laughs> but this morning, I went up and picked up everything that fell. Yeah. Put it back in its proper place so it would be ready for use. And when we fall in sin, it's not our job to stay there Amen. and say, oh, Amen. nobody ever had to deal with this. Yeah. I'm the only one that ever had to go through what I'm going through. 
No, get up and retrace your steps and get back to God. Because God can use even your sifting to strengthen your faith. God can use even your sifting to encourage your brothers and sisters. I hear Romans 8, 28 in the background. All things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to his purpose. Well, my brothers and sisters, the, the bad news is that we will be sifted. But the good news is that Jesus has already prayed for us. And he is going to use our sifting to strengthen our faith. So in actuality, there are two hands on the sifter. Satan has a plan, but God has a purpose. Yes. Satan wants to hurt you, but God wants to heal you. Yes. Satan wants to sift you, but God wants to strengthen you. Yes. Satan wants to ruin you, but God wants to refine you. Yes. Satan wants to destroy you, yes. but God wants to deliver you. Yes. Joseph said it this way, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And after the cross, after Jesus went and died for your sins and mine, we see Peter has retraced his steps, and he is strengthening the brethren. Never again will Peter stand up and brag about his courage. Never again will he say, I'll follow you anywhere. I don't care what the rest of them do. In the future, Peter is encouraging everyone to walk in humility instead. Let me show it to you, 1 Peter 5 and 5. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to your elders. Clothe yourself, all of you, with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 1 Peter 4 and 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened. But God is faithful. We see Peter time and time again after the cross strengthening the brothers. He strengthened the brothers on the day of Pentecost, proclaiming the message of God and 3,000 are saved. He strengthened the brothers in Acts chapter 4 as he proclaimed the message of salvation to all his beloved brothers and sisters. And we see him time and time again strengthening the brothers. Why? Because Jesus warned him and because Jesus prayed for him. So, my brothers and sisters, I got some bad news for you. Sifting time is coming. There's a sifting in your future. But I've also got some good news for you. Jesus has already prayed for you. Matter of fact, in 1 Peter 5 and 10, Peter says, May the God of all grace, who has called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, make you perfect, strengthen, and establish you. The bad news is Satan wants to sift us. But the good news is Jesus has already prayed for us. Is there anybody here today that's glad that somebody has prayed for you? Is there anybody here today that knows the only reason you made it is because somebody prayed for you? Somebody prayed for me. Had me on their mind. Took the time and prayed for me. My mama prayed for me. Had me on her mind. When I didn't have Jesus on my mind. But she took the time and prayed for me. My daddy prayed for me. Had me on his mind. Took the time and prayed for me. My pastor prayed for me. Had me on his mind took the time and prayed for me. But if none of them ever did, I'm so glad that Jesus prayed for me. Had me on his mind when he headed to Calvary's cross. Had me on his mind when they nailed him to the cross. Had me on his mind when they crowned his head with thorns, pierced his feet, and he died for your sins and mine. But that's not where the story is. Because my Bible says that early Sunday morning, he rose from the grave with all power in his hand. I'm so glad he prayed. I'm so glad he prayed 
for me. Father, we thank your praise that in your sovereignty, you use even our sifting for our strength. We thank you, Lord, that Satan can make a request, but the prayers of Jesus override any request of Satan. And we thank you, Father, that even when we weren't thinking about you, you were already praying for us. And you had us on your mind. And that your prayers had a plan and a purpose. That we may have a future and a hope. Thank you, Lord, for praying for us. Thank you, Lord, for not giving up on us. Thank you, Lord, for loving us enough to send your son to die in our place and redeem us from our sins and unto yourself. Now, Lord, help us this week to be people of prayer. Help us this week to trust in you when sifting comes. And help us this week, once we retrace our steps, to be a blessing to someone else. And encourage them to trust you too. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. In your name we pray. And all God's people say amen. 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 If you can, stand to your feet. Because we don't want anyone to miss this moment. While the preacher was preaching, the God of all grace has been speaking to you and speaking to your heart about your need to have a personal relationship with him. If you're here today and you aren't sure that if you died tonight, never saw Monday morning, what would happen to your eternal soul? Not sure where you would go. Not sure what would happen to you. We've got a remedy for that. Jesus says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall be saved. Shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That means that anyone here that places their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior can receive the gift of eternal life by faith in him. So if that's you today, we extend this invitation to you. Step out of the aisle, come down and take this front seat. Well, let us know that you want to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Uh, we will uh, help you to understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Shall there be one? I've already accepted Jesus Christ. Uh, I know he's God's son. I know he died on the cross for my sins. And I've accepted him as my Lord and Savior. Uh, but you don't have a church home. You don't have a body of believers that you meet with on a regular basis. Not just to hear someone preach the word, but to understand how to apply the word of God to the situations and circumstances of your life. Uh, you don't have a family of brothers and sisters to walk with you, uh, to cheer you on when you get it right, and to pick you up when you get it wrong. Uh, and to love you either way. Uh, God never intended for us to follow him by ourselves. He has created a community for us to grow in grace and the knowledge of, knowledge of our love for the Savior. He has created the church. So if that's you today, you don't have a body of believers to walk with on this journey. The second invitation is for you. So that'll be one. Oh, the road is rough.
may be seated. And if, you know, after the benediction, uh, you decide that uh, you want to accept Christ as Lord and Savior, or you want to uh, join this local fellowship, uh, and you can just come and have a conversation with me. I'll be glad to talk to you uh, about that. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts and our minds uh, for communion uh, on this uh, first Sunday of November. 11th Sunday of the year, and by God's grace, he has allowed us to see. Amen, amen. I ask the deacons and ministers to come forward at this time. Shall we pray? Sovereign Lord, creator of all, we thank you, Father, for another communion Sunday, for another opportunity to uh, reaffirm our faith and to join our brothers and sisters around the world uh, in uh, taking part in the ordinance of the church. Uh, we thank you, Father, that displayed your love uh, to the world uh, throughout all history by sending your son to die on the cross for the sins of humanity yes. and that all who believe in him uh, now by faith have eternal life with you right now yes. and we know who our father is and we know our father loves us and we can rest in that love Now, Lord, we ask that you bless uh, this bread and this cup uh, as it reminds us of uh, your body and your blood shed for us. And that, that salvation was not cheap. Uh, but the Lord of glory laid down his very life uh, that the children of God may have eternal life now and forever. So, Father, if there's any of us here uh, who have uh, unforgiveness or sin uh, that we have not confessed, oh Lord, may we confess it now before your throne. May we not move forward and receive your body willingly holding on to our sin. Sanctify us, oh Lord, for your purposes and your glory. In Christ Jesus' name. Pray and all God's people said amen. 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 If you not, have not received the communion cup on the way in, can you raise your hand? If you've not received the communion cup on the way in, Let's see one, two, three. Two killed. Raise your hand if you did not receive the communion cup. Keep it up. been baptized and you have not received the communion cup, keep your hand up.
that which I receive from the Lord, I also give unto you. That our Lord and Savior, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and blessed it and broke it. And as he passed out to the disciples, he said, this is my body. As often as you do this, do so in remembrance of me. Let us eat together. In the same way, he passed the cup after supper and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. As often as we drink it, do so in remembrance of me. Let us drink together. Apostle Paul helps us to understand in 1 Corinthians 11 that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Uh, it lets us know that communion is an act of faith. That every time uh, we gather together and take communion, no matter when it is, uh, we are displaying to the world uh, our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Uh, we believe that the same Jesus took the last supper with his disciples and said I won't drink this new this wine again until I drink it new with you in my kingdom. Yeah. The same Jesus is going to come back and receive us unto himself at the end of time uh, to stay with him for all eternity uh, and worship him and also sit down at his table uh, and eat with the one who has saved our soul. Amen. So communion is an act of faith. It looks back to the Last Supper, it looks forward uh, to the coming of the King of Heaven uh, to receive his children unto himself. Amen? Amen. 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 Rise to your feet and prepare to depart this place whenever God's presence. Uh, I want to remind you again that there will be a meeting for Harvest Fest immediately after the benediction. So if you want more information about Harvest Fest or if you are interested in serving, we need more help. Helpers need it. All hands on deck. Uh, and hang around after the benediction. There'll be a short meeting right here in the sanctuary uh, after the benediction. Amen? Amen. 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 We want to thank our uh, visitors for joining us on the day. Uh, we pray that you have heard from the Lord uh, during your time here with us. Uh, it is our desire uh, that if you have not, that you will accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And if you are looking for a church home, that the Lord will lead you to a place. Uh, where they preach, teach, and live the word of God. Uh, because your father knows what's best for you. Amen? Amen. 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 The blood. Father God, for the amazing grace that is gathered worship, and for what you do uh, when all the saints get together. Uh, we pray, Father, that you will allow your word to do its perfect work in our hearts and in our minds in the coming days. Help us, O oh Lord, to meditate on this word uh, and to yield to your spirit's leading and guiding throughout this week. Help us, O oh Lord, uh, when sifting times come, uh, not to give up, uh, but to get up uh, and to keep our faith in you. Thank you, Father, for your encouragement. Thank you, Father, for your grace. Thank you, Father, for praying for us. Now unto him who's able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before his presence with exceeding great glory. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power his fourth now and forevermore. Reach us to the Lord.